Okay, so I'd like to uh, present some notes or an overview on model reduction. In particular, we're thinking about this whole concept of reduced order modeling. And what the theme of these sets of lectures will be on is on nonlinear model reduction. And I want to give a sort of a high level overview of what we want to accomplish in this. So there's a lot of different aspects of model reduction, and this is just one where we're going to think about thinking about nonlinear dynamical systems and how to think about solving them in an efficient way using the fact that there is, in fact, usually some low dimensional embedding in which you can do computations in a much faster, more efficient way. So let me give you an example of what it means to think about the idea of dimensionality reduction. And I'm going to motivate this by several ex examples that come from biological, physical, engineering sciences, just so you get a concept of what we're trying to actually do with this model reduction framework. The first example I'm going to give here is actually from recordings of an antenna lobe on a locust. What they do is stick probes in this antenna lobe and they record off these neurons. And the neurons themselves are spiking and in that spiking is information. Information about uh, sensory input into the system. And the data typically ends up looking something like this where these are different trials or different recordings from different neurons. You apply stimulus and you get these spikes. And what you'd like to do is make sense of all this. There are maybe hundreds of thousands to millions of neurons in this olfactory processing system. And one of the questions you could ask is, well, how does this thing actually decode information? Now, one of the most amazing things that was observed, and this is uh, 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 Gilles Laurent's group that observed this uh, on the locust, is that they said, okay, let's take all these spike recordings and let's look at the firing rate activity. So not just spikes, but you know, the density of spikes. And then what they did is a singular value decomposition or a principal component analysis. They said in the first three principal components, this collection of hundreds of thousands of neurons looks something like this here. Let me explain what this is. So what this is, is right here where it says uh, B is where this thing is basically sitting. The activity, and this is in principal component space one, two, and three. And here's the axis, coordinate axis is right here. And it's sitting right over here. And then when they apply stimulus, it takes a trajectory up to this fixed point. You turn it off, comes back down. Turn it on, comes back down. So this entire system, which is being driven by noise processes and stochastics, looks to be three-dimensional. This picture kind of conveys that idea. So the idea is you could do a simulation on hundreds of thousands of millions of neurons, or with the right basis set or the right representation of the dynamics, you could drop it down to three dimensions, which is what the data says is sort of the intrinsic dimensionality of this olfactory system. And that's the kind of thing we want to take advantage of in this reduced order modeling framework. So it's a biological system, but you see this across the sciences. So I'm giving you here an example, for instance, uh, for instance of an optical system. And this is in these uh, collection of uh, waveguides where you see self-localizing patterns as you increase intensity, so it's a nonlinear phenomena, yet everything looks to be very low dimensional. You also see this in turbulent flows here. You see large scale structures uh, that develop out of the fluid system. Same thing here. Here's a turbulent flow uh, that's being developed. This is a, a hurricane off the coast of Florida. And again, you see this very large spatial temporal structure that is forming there. Uh, and of course, if you were to put this on some very high dimensional grid, you could do the simulation, but really the thing you're after is this low dimensional structure that's embedded in this seemingly high dimensional system. Down here, this is what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate. When you cool at super cool atoms to, you know, millikelvins, microkelvins, you can get atoms to basically form a, a, a condensed matter of state, which is this Bose-Einstein condensate. Again, a low dimensional representation. And over here you have this granular flow in a force system where you see clear structures develop from a micro scale physics and it's exhibited on a macro scale. So these are examples, just like the neural system, of systems that develop low dimensional coherent structures that you would like to take advantage of instead of doing very large simulations. Is there a way to trade this out? and frame the problem in some low dimensional embedding that you see clearly here uh, develops in the system. Okay, so that's the, 
That's the main idea. Of course, what we're going to be working with is directly is with equations. So we're going to start off here. This is going to be our basic framing of the problem. We're going to assume either we have a partial differential equation or a large system of differential equations where the state of the system is given by u, a vector u. And what we're interested in is how does that change in time. And we're going to make an assumption that the du dt depends upon some linear term here, right? So L times U, so L can be prescribed some linear dependence in the problem. It can also take into account derivatives, things like diffusion, advection processes. These are linear dynamics. They're all encoded in this L operator. And then we have the nonlinear dynamics, okay? Um, so we're going to want to understand how this thing evolves in time. And one of the things that we know if we derive this system, let's say, from a large partial differential equation, then this is a very high dimensional system, U is, okay, with a lot of independent degrees of freedom that are connected get together to all the other, uh, all the other uh, points in the system. And, but on the other hand, you also observed from what we just saw that uh, chances are there exists some low dimensional embedding of where this dynamics is happening. So there's a couple other things here. You typically are going to prescribe some boundary conditions that go with this, as well as initial conditions. So this is the full setup of the system. PDE, or system of differential equations that rises from a PDE, high dimensional, linear and nonlinear terms, some boundary conditions, initial conditions. And what you would like to do is find an efficient way to simulate this into the future. Now, we learned a lot of numerical techniques for doing this, but when this gets to be very high dimensional, it becomes quite a challenge. Uh, as big as the computers we are, have right now, uh, I can give you a problem that will exceed the cap capacity of your computation at this point. So you can think about reduced order modeling as for very large scale systems. This is not necessarily geared for smaller systems you can put on a laptop. This is stuff that would go on a supercomputer or are potentially problems that are even beyond the reach of supercomputers at this point. Now, the challenge ultimately is just going to come down to that nonlinear term. If this thing were linear, we would be in good shape. We could actually do quite a bit. But the nonlinearity is actually where all the complications arise uh, and also where all the interesting phenomena typically occur, right? So a lot of things that we're very interested in modeling uh, and all the interesting dynamics we see uh, that nonlinearity drives these processes. On the other hand, it's that nonlinearity that's going to create a lot of our computational challenge. And how we handle that nonlinearity uh, is going to be really important for us to make effective reduced order models. Okay, so what's going to be our process to solve problems? Well, in reduced order modeling, one of the first steps you've got to do is you've actually got to uh, potentially do a short time run of that very high dimensional system. Okay, so you're not necessarily committing to doing uh, a large scale simulation of the system for a long time, but you want to do a burst of high fidelity simulation for some amount of time. And what you're going to do is collect the state of the system at different snapshots of time. So this X matrix here is a collection of data. So U1 is the data of that dynamical system collected at time t1. U2 is at time t2, all the way up to time t of m. So we're just simply sampling our dynamics, the full state dynamics. And this matrix X tells us, you know, stacks up our data, and then we can start thinking about uh, doing an analysis of where does this data live and what kind of space does it live in. And one of the, uh, you know, standard techniques for getting at sort of what is the intrinsic coordinates or the dimension of the dynamics or data is through the singular value decomposition. Perhaps one of the uh, most important algorithms that you can uh, use in data analysis. It also frames how we think about reduced order modeling here. So the way the singular value decomposition works, it takes this data matrix and decomposes it into three matrices you're guaranteed to have a singular value decomposition of any matrix. And so you take your data matrix, X, which is this box here, and this box has a certain number of high dimensional 
space here. So that these are all your, when you discretize a partial differential equation, you might have millions or billions of states of the system, and then the columns are the snapshots in time. And what this matrix decomposition does, it creates for you three additional matrices. The U matrix, <coughs> which tells you about the spatial correlations in your data. This is this matrix here. It's the same size if you use the economy SVD, which is what we mostly want to think about in this case. Although I will have some separate lectures about the singular value decomposition outside of this. Remember, this is just an overview. But the idea is that this thing will create this embedding space spatially. It also create a sigma matrix, which is a diagonal matrix, which tells you essentially how the importance of these, uh, uh, of these vectors in weighting of the data. So it's going to give you an orthogonal set of vectors in which the data is embedded, and it's going to tell you how important each direction is. In other words, with your data, how much does it project into each of these individual directions? And then the V gives you the corresponding time dynamics for each of these uh, uh, vectors in U. Okay? Again, we'll have a separate lecture, separate set of lectures actually, just on the singular value decomposition because it, it in and of itself is one of the most important workhorse algorithms available to us in thinking about doing model reduction. Now, oftentimes, the singular value decomposition, these modes that come out are often called POD modes, proper orthogonal decomposition. So that's one standard term for them. Uh, people have used other uh, terminology for this. It's also known as the Hotling transformation, kahun uh modes, uh, or kahun lova analysis, also empirical orthogonal functions, and it's very closely related to principal component analysis. And the only difference between principal component analysis and all those other terms is that what you would do for each column of data is you would uh, mean subtract and set the variance to zero to one. So every row would have mean zero unit variance. And this way is one way to handle the data so that you can normalize it in some sense. So PCA enforces that. POD, SVD, EOFs, Karlhoven, they don't necessarily enforce that kind of normalization. But they're really all the same. They're the SVD. Now what's important about this SVD is that the SVD gives you a principled way to do a low rank truncation of the data. In other words, find the dimensionality of your data, or the intrinsic dimension of your data, where you can use some low rank or low dimensional embedding to represent your data. So what I've done here is taken my data matrix and said, hey, look, I've taken a lot of snapshots of this uh, system, and I might find and the way you would find this is looking at your singular values, you might find that, hey, look, there's about uh, 10 modes or R modes that matter in the data that have 99% of the variance or 99.9% .9 of the variance. In other words, they capture most of the variability of the data. So what you'd want to do is say, well, if that's the case, if I find R modes that really dominate everything, I'd want to pull out R modes from my U matrix, the first R modes. I'm going to stack those in a matrix called phi of r. So the r represents the rank, and this phi of r represents the low dimensional manifold or subspace in which this data is embedded. These are the coordinate system that I want to use in which I know the data is best represented. In fact, it's guaranteed to be the best representation in an L2 sense. Now, how you would find the number of modes in truncation, again, there will be a separate lecture related to the singular value decomposition. But normally what you'd find is a principled way to take R modes out of this, and that's going to give us an R rank or low rank truncation uh, of, our, of our model. So once you have this, now you can start building a reduced order model. And the way you're going to do this is through this technique called Galerican projection. So what you're going to do is say, hey, look, my U, as it changes in time, is I will do this Galerican projected framework, which is I'm going to say that I'm going to embed all my, all my 
uh, dynamics in this phi of r space, in other words, this r rank subspace where most of the data was found. And here, a of t is now the, co the coordinate system I want to discover. It has all the time dynamics on this subspace. So I'm going to basically assume my solution is sort of a separation of variables solution where I embed everything in this low rank subspace and now my job is just to find A of t. Now one thing to keep in mind about these phi of r phi of r has a bunch of modes, r of them in fact. So these are vectors and when you do the SVD, these are the first R columns of U. So each one of these columns is orthogonal to all other columns. So in other words, if you have phi of J transpose phi of K, so I want to take the inner product of any two of these, well, this thing here is either equal to 1, because the U's were an orthonormal basis, so if J of K if j is equal to k, in other words, it's the same vector, then the, it's unit length. However, if j is not equal to k, then they're orthogonal. And then you get zero. So this is an idea here that's very important, and it's very nice that the SVD automatically gives you an orthonormal embedding space, which has this nice orthogonality property. Now that becomes important because one of the properties we're going to use is the fact that this property suggests that the transpose of the R matrix times of the phi matrix rank truncated with R times C of R is equal just to the identity. Okay, and we're going to use that in our next step when we plug this expansion right here into our governing nonlinear dynamical system. Okay, so that's an important point to keep in mind. And again, you get it for free from the SVD, this orthogonality, orthonormal basis that you're going to start using now to embed all your dynamics in. Okay, so now we have this orthogonality property, we have some low rank subspace we want to work in. What do we do next? Well, what we could do is simply plug in that expansion, multiply on the left side by the transpose of phi of r, and what you end up getting is this equation right here. This is your low rank dynamics. What I've traded out is the evolution on this u vector, which is very high dimensional, for evolution on the a vector, which is r dimensional. And here's what the equations look like. So dA dt, so now what I'm solving for is the time dynamics associated with each mode, each of those POD, uh, POD modes that I actually extracted out with the SVD. And this becomes my reduced order model. So I went from an n-dimensional space down to an r-dimensional space. And if I have a very small uh, rank truncation, it means I've got myself a very large dimensionality reduction. Now this isn't so bad except for, again, the nonlinear term. So if you look at this, I'm just going to look here on the left side for a minute. I have the time dynamics of A, and then here I have the L, L matrix, which is essentially the linear dynamics times phi of R, and over here on the left is phi R transpose. And so I could pre-compute all of this, and this just becomes one vector multiplied by A. So it's kind of trivial to do. The linear terms are trivial to handle in this setup. The problem is the nonlinear terms. As I've suggested, nonlinearity is what kills you here, which is now you have phi transpose r times the evaluation of the nonlinearity in this low dimensional embedding space. So every time you, you update the a values, you have to update the nonlinearity. So every single time step requires you to reevaluate the nonlinearity and do an inner product with phi transpose r. Whereas the linear terms, I can just do this all once at the beginning of the computation and I don't have to do it again. It's done. Here I have to keep doing this and this is very expensive actually. And let me show you why. I'm going to give you a simple example 
of the challenges that are imposed by this nonlinearity. So let's say that the nonlinearity is something kind of simple. The nonlinearity is a function of u, our state space, which is suppose it's u cubed. So I have a cubic nonlinearity in my PDE. And what I'd like to do is evaluate that cubic in this reduced order model. And let's do something simple. Suppose that I find that the rank of this system is there's two modes that matter. Okay, so I want to do a two-mode expansion. Now watch what happens just with a simple two-mode expansion with a cubic nonlinearity. So a, a two-mode expansion basically is going to assume that u, state of my system, is going to be some coefficient a1 times phi1, which is the first POD mode, times a2 times phi2, which is the second POD mode. Now, presumably I would have found this from the snapshots, and what I need to determine is a1 and a2. What are their dynamics? So once I determine a1 and a2, my solution is right here. I can just take a1 times phi1, a2 times phi2. I already know phi1, I already know phi2. I discovered those from the snapshot matrix and the SVD. So I'm going to take this he thing here, but now I've got to take the cube of it. Right? So a simple two-mode expansion in that cubic expands out to four terms. And there they are, at the bottom here. So now I have four terms, and then once I get these four terms, remember, I still have to hit it with an inner product. So the simple cubic requires me to compute four inner products. Remember, each one of these, phi 1 and phi 2, is length n, so it's very high dimensional. So the inner product computation I have to do is very large. So even if I have this low dimensional embedding sitting there, if I have to work with this with nonlinearities, just think about this thing. Maybe if I had a 10 mode expansion, a 10 mode expansion going through that cubic would generate a very large collection of terms, and I have to do an inner product on every single one of these terms to compute how it's projecting into my phi of R space. This is the challenge of nonlinearities in reduced order models. And in fact, it becomes the heart of thinking about nonlinear model reduction is how to handle nonlinearities in efficient ways. And we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about it from a historical perspective and building up towards understanding how would we be able to do this computation in some kind of fast way. Okay, so here is the summary of this model reduction architecture. I kind of stayed high level and I want to touch back on the key aspects of this and this is what we're going to spend a lot of time building out going very slowly through examples and code just so that you understand all these pieces. But the idea is the following, you're given some differential equation or partial differential equation that's been discretized and it's very high dimensional. So it has a linear and a nonlinear part. So that's the first step is you, you have that system and typically in model reduction you have to do initially some high fidelity simulation of this system. But it allows you to produce a snap snapshot matrix X. And these are vectors U at T1, T2, all the way to say P snapshots of the system. So you take lots of snapshots of the system uh, and this thing here is something like an N by P matrix. And what you're going to do with this X matrix is you're going to do a singular value decomposition. And in that singular value decomposition, you're going to evaluate how many modes you're going to keep, what is the underlying or intrinsic dimensionality of the system, or underlying rank of the system, and you're going to keep a small collection of modes. In other words, when you look at the, the U matrix that's produced in the SVD, you're going to take a, the first R columns that uh, would represent the low dimensional embedding space of this dynamical system. Now the second thing, after we've done this, discovered the low dimensional structure we want to work on, <coughs> is that we have to actually go and build a model now for how the evolution of the dynamics happens in that low dimensional subspace, and we do this with the Galerican expansion. So we say that U itself is essentially now we're going to use a basis set of functions, which are my R rank truncation of the SVD modes, times A of T. Now, A of T itself is of rank R. So what I've really done is said, look, R is much smaller than N. So this original system 
is very high dimensional, potentially millions, billions, trillions of degrees of freedom, which might come from a discretization of some very large partial differential equation. But then I might find some R rank truncation. Maybe I find 50 modes, maybe 10, maybe 200, which is much smaller than the millions or billions that I have over here. So I'm going to try to project everything down into this rank R subspace in which I observe the, most of the dynamics to be evolving on. So I'm going to plug this into this equation, multiply by phi R transpose, and I get my, finally, my Galerican projected dynamics, which is a system of R differential equations. So I went from N differential equations to R differential equations. That's it. That's the whole reduced order modeling story. The problems come in the fact that how do I discover the right embeddings and how do I handle that nonlinearity if I'm going to go to this low rank structure. So most of what we're going to talk about is handling that nonlinearity in what we do in the future here. All right, so that is the general broad overview. And again, we're going to think about workhorse methods. Singular value decomposition is going to be one of those. The proper orthogonal decomposition, which is, again is just a name, another name for that singular value decomposition. We're going to talk a lot about Galerican projections then, because once you discover from here your low dimensional embedding, how do you project your whole dynamical system into that low dimensional space? And then the most important thing that we have to build out is handling the nonlinearity, and we're going to use several nonlinear interpolation techniques. We're going to cover what's called GAPI POD and also the DIME method, which is discrete empirical interpolating method. Uh, this is a, a method, and both these methods are all about the fact that when you go from a high dimensional space, this nonlinearity is also embedded in a low dimensional space. Do I need to do n dimensional inner products to get me an accurate approximation in this r dimensional space? The answer, of course, is no. There is a very efficient way to evaluate the nonlinearity in r dimensional space which is much better than doing full inner products in n dimensions. And so we'll talk a lot about historical developments around these ideas. Once we've kind of outlined most of this and developed it out, we'll have a set of lectures on singular value decomposition, on POD methods, on Galerican projection, and then this nonlinear interpolation. We'll talk about emerging methods of machine learning and manifold learning that allow us to do even more things for parametrized partial differential equations or nonlinear model reduction that sort of represents state of the art of where people are right now. So that's the overview. Uh, we're going to start building it all out from here, and, but it's very important that you understand the generic architecture first before you start getting into the details. And if you can understand this basic framing, then it will help you understand exactly where we want to go at each one of these points because the rest of this nonlinear model reduction course is really just geared at hitting these topics and, and, and building them out so you understand how each one of these relates to the overall theme and computational efficiency we need to use to make these reduced order models efficient. Okay, so I'll see you in these lectures as we go forward in the class.